Well, good day, and it's Saturday over here in Marsh and Manitoba, and, it's, and the sun is still shining. We're still looking into seeds of truth and faith. We got today, and Lord willing, tomorrow to finish up Second Thessalonians, and then we'll move on into Timothy. And our subtitle today is Warning Against Disorderly Idleness. Boy, there is a mouthful there. Warning Against Disorderly Idleness. But before we move on, you know, I always like to share a little testimony of what's going on out at the mall. Today's our last day out there. We've been out there for three weekends, and we've been handing out books, books, and more books. <laughs> so these little booklets were averaging around probably 500 books a day, four to 500 books a day. But the thing that I wanted to uh, just reflect on a little bit and give praise to God for is that how many people are you going to be using these for home Bible studies, uh, children's studies, and Sunday school curriculum? And uh, it's just been amazing. You know, and I thank God for that. I, I just see that Ella came up and Ella, I thank you for waving. I know you're there too, Sheila. But I want to tell you, Ella, every day a whole bunch of those German ones that you translated in the David song are still going out. People like them and take them. So bless you for translating them into German. Uh, because people, colonies everywhere are taking the German ones. I don't know how many we got left, but praise God for that. And then just another little testimony. If you have some freedom and you're not sure where you want a fellowship tomorrow on Mother's Day, we're in Gospel Chapel at the Brokery. We're going to be talking about Rebecca, Circle of Faith, and you're more than welcome to come and visit with us, visit with the body of believers there. And come out and join us. We look forward to that on Mother's Day to be able to talk a little bit about Rebecca. Now, you may not know much about her, but come on out tomorrow. We'll talk about how she was just surrounded in faith. And so today, as we go back out to the mall, we'll be out there. If you get an opportunity, those that live close by, come and get some books. You know, you may not have them for need them for your own family, but... I've been telling people, or do you got some kids and young people and that who are neighbors? Well, yeah, well, take them to them, be a missionary, you know, hand them out, you know, wherever, you know, people were telling us all kinds of places and more were going out to the First Nation people and more were going out to the colonies and more were going out to communities around about. Praise God. And we need to be in prayer that God would anoint the seeds that are being planted. Amen. So. You know, it's a joy that we're finishing up, but it's a joy sometimes, or it's sad sometimes, because, wow, we get a chance to pray for a lot of people. We get an opportunity to meet people, and we're praying today that whoever the Lord has in mind will come. There are people out there that are hungry for the Word of God. Thank God for that. And thank God for all of you who gather together throughout the 24 hours to listen to these teachings concerning the word of god because we've been promoting you got to get into the word so the word can get into us so we as we talk about seeds of truth and faith and that's what we're doing we're stepping out in faith and taking the seeds that god gives us and we're planting that truth into people's hearts but paul is going to give a warning today to the church again about how they've been living and how they've been acting it seems like for some strange reason, some of the believers, they got saved and now they were just going to sit back and wait for the coming of the Lord and didn't feel they had to even work, <laughs> didn't even have to have a job and just depend on the church to take care of them and give them food and that. Well, Paul's going to be a little bit hard on that area because he wants to remind them that, uh, yes, you're a believer, but you still have responsibilities. You still need to do things to look after yourself. But you, this now you do it not in your own flesh, but you do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's why I titled this that we've got a warning against disorderly idleness. Okay, so as we go on, let's begin to our journey. Um, verse 6, where Paul speaks to us uh concerning what we should be doing as believers in Christ. 
And in verse 6, again, the, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has that in the game, our Lord Jesus Christ. It seems like throughout First and Second Thessalonians, the people really needed to get to understand the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says here, as we look in verse 6, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, everything that Paul was trying to teach them or command them, the idea of command is to empower, to order, to give instruction, authority, to command them that what they do, they do in the name of our, he belongs to us and we belong to him, Lord he is the master and, and director of our lives. Jesus, he is the one who saves us. And Christ, he is the one who anoints us. So every time, you know, it's so sad. And I've said this dozens of times before. We see these names, we just read over them. And we forget that each one of these names have tremendous anointing and power within them. That in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We need to get back to the place of underlining these names because Paul is saying, but we commanded you, but we didn't command you in ourselves. We commanded you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. Now, there, see, and so now we got brothers. You know, I mean, brothers and sisters that walk disorderly. Yeah, that was the problem. And Paul was saying, withdraw for them. Don't hang around them. You know, sometimes negativity can create negativity. Sometimes things that other people do, instead of lifting you up, can pull you down. Do you know what I'm saying? And I think that's what Paul was concerned about. That you withdraw, which means the idea to depart or abandon or leave those ones who are disorderly and he so he says that that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and that idea of disorderly means unruly <laughs> you know what i mean chaotic rebellious now that couldn't possibly be in the church could it <laughs> could there be those kinds of people in the church that are unruly chaotic and and rebellious well, Paul was saying that there is, and he is saying, withdraw from them. He's not saying get rid of them, but he's saying, you know, withdraw from them, because that kind of disorderliness can spread like bad weeds throughout a church. And it causes other people to be disorderly and unruly and chaotic and rebellious. And Paul was saying, you know, don't don't have fellowship with that. Get into with those who want to get going for Jesus Christ. Amen. Then he goes on disorderly, he says, brothers who walk disorderly and not according to the traditions which he received from us. Now, we talked about this the other day, the word traditions and beliefs and practices and habits, you know. Uh, again, they didn't have the Gospels yet. They didn't have the letters of Paul. So much of the teaching that was done by the leaders, both the apostles and others like Timothy, Salvanius, Barnabas, I mean, John, Mark, the list goes on, were teachings that they had walked in the Lord, had experienced, had grown in the Lord, had become part of their lives. And that's why when Paul uses the word traditions, he's using it in the idea of the habits or the practices. You saw our habits, how we prayed and worshiped God, how we how we lived and, and dealt with concerning different things. You saw how we practice, you know, when it comes to communion and evangelism and outreach. And he's saying, I want you to hold on to those patterns now. Those are the things that you need to hold on to. So, you know, a lot of times when we think of this word traditions, of course, we think of it in our cultural background, you know, whether you're British or, or Mennonite or German or French or Scandinavian. And I mean, we could go all the way around the world and think of, well, is called Paul calling us to live out our cultural traditions? No, he's calling us to live out our Christian traditions, <laughs> our Christian way of living according to Jesus Christ, according to his gospel. 
And Paul is saying, as I have lived it, you live it also. Follow me as I follow Christ. And so he goes on, these traditions which you have received from us. That's a powerful statement because we don't realize often that we're leading people by our actions. You know, whether you like it or not, people are watching you all the time. You know, I at first I didn't notice that as much until I went to Myanmar. Okay, and started living amongst the Ketchin people. You know, when you're living about a half a million people in a city and there's only four white people in that half a million people, you know what? You get the opportunity to stand out. You know, and people watch how you eat. They watch how you dress. They watch how you talk. They watch how you drive. They watch how you go in the market. They watch everything. How you drink your tea. <laughs> how you dress. How you comb your hair. How you shave. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. They watch. And they're trying to see, okay, how does this foreigner live? Well, what you want people to see is how do you live in Jesus Christ? Do you live according to his way? Do you follow Jesus Christ? Do you follow the traditions of Christ, uh, the traditions of the gospel? And we need to be more aware of that. You know, I, I see people all the time and, and if they would be more aware of what comes out of here and what comes out of their actions... Wow, I think there would be a, you know, they would see it. Hey, there's some need for change here. Because Jesus wouldn't do that. You know, we have that little bracelet sometimes people put on their hands. What would Jesus do? And that's the whole key here. As Paul says, I'm following Jesus. And so you follow me. Because I'm living a way that what, how Jesus would live. And it's like, because I am, you should be living that way too. And so... That's what he's encouraging the church. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could have a couple sermons on that where we said, okay, all of us in this room right now, we're going to make a commitment to follow Jesus with all our heart as Lord Jesus and Christ. And we're going to walk in such a way that we will not be ashamed if people follow us or see us or watch us or live with us wherever we go. We would not need to be ashamed because we're walking out the life of Christ just as Christ walked it out before us. Amen. Boy, that would kind of have a revolution happening in amongst the people, wouldn't it? Then that bring about revival instead of thinking, well, this is what I want to do. This is what feels good for me. This is what I, this is my right. You know, no, it's the thing is we've died to ourselves and lived for Christ. And now we're walking out our lives according to him. Well, then Paul goes on and he says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. See, there it is again. You know. You know how you ought to follow us. And so that's why I say, you know, we need to be aware. We need to be aware, you know, especially, you know, uh, I've been in this community, uh, in this local community now since 1980. And I get different people that, you know, have come up from our youth group when I was a youth pastor and then come up later on when I was a, senior pastor and then also as a businessman and you know yeah i made mistakes and sometimes like even yesterday i was saying to some you know i hope i haven't caused you to stumble anywhere and i just want you to know the love of jesus and she said no 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 i'm not angry because of you i'm angry because of a whole bunch of other people and i said praise god <laughs> you know i'm off the hook on that one there's still more probably but Paul is saying, follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Here's that word disorder. And actually, in these few scriptures, it gets used three times. Paul says, you know, get away, withdraw from the disorderly. But then he's also saying, but now I'm telling you to get away from those disorderly. But now look at us. Have we been disorderly? You know, and Paul makes a testimony and he says, no, we haven't. We walked according to the uh, Lord Jesus Christ, and so should you. The way we follow him is the way we f we follow each other. And he says, it says, disorderly among you, for we were not disorderly among you. And there was others. See, people were coming by. You know, you get traveling evangelists, traveling teachers, and, and uh, you know, they in the pulpit they're one way, and through the rest of the week they're another way. And Paul was getting really upset about this this conduct of people 
and their attitudes of how they were living on the day they were teaching versus how they were living throughout the week. And Paul was saying, we weren't disorderly. We we lived the standards of Jesus Christ moment by moment, day by day. And he's going to go on and tell us that. For he goes on and says in verse 8, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. Now you say, well, why? Why did he say that? Well, you know, grain sometimes was hard to come by. And it was hard to, you know, to make enough bread for their own family. And uh, we know around these times there was a famine in Jerusalem and things were pretty tight. And Paul says, you know, we didn't even eat your bread. Matter of fact, we we wanted you to be okay. And so we took care of looking after and buying our own bread. That's what he's saying here. Because he didn't want to be a burden. He He didn't. He didn't want uh, people to do things because they had to, but he wanted them to do things because they loved to. So he wasn't a burden. He said, even even with your own bread, we weren't a burden with you. And, 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 and we came to you. He said, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. We just came. You know, we just came, you know, free of charge. And I think that whole idea of free of charge really blows people away. You know, when we travel around the world, people ask us, well, how do you do this? And I say, well, we've got other brothers and sisters around the world that are giving, that are helping financially. And we're just coming alongside you free of charge. And we just want to bless you and pour into you. We I probably call in and even at the mall, we get that ask probably <laughs> once an hour. How do you give these books away free of charge? Because there's other believers in that that believe in the vision of getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out into all the world. And they're giving abundantly. And as they give abundantly, we can give abundantly. Amen. And that's why. And people just say, well, thank you. Thank you. You know, people reading. It just, again, it amazes me. You know, so we didn't eat of your bread. But he goes on free of charge. But we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So Paul is saying, you know, we know Paul was a tent maker and he had kind of a, on the side, he might, might have been sewing stuff, you know, maybe he had a set of needles that he carried around with them and everything, you know, that he could sew leather with and sew and fix tents with, you know, and earn a little bit of money. So that he wouldn't have to be a burden to the people he was speaking to. Oh, I know they fed him. And I know they probably gave them houses. just uh, Not houses, but a room to sleep in or a mat to sleep on. I, I understand that. People do that with us as we travel around the world. But we don't do it that, you know, you must do this before we have fellowship with you. No, they we just go. And wherever God leads, we want to follow. And whatever God blesses us with, we want to receive it. But on the other hand, we don't want to be a burden. We don't want to be a burden. I've I've experienced that, that sometimes places we go, you know, they want to bless us. You know, the brothers and sisters want to bless us, but maybe all that they have is a couple of eggs, you know. And you're going to get a couple boiled eggs with some boiled water with a little bit of tea in it. And maybe a little bit of salt that you can sprinkle on it. And that's it. That's the whole thing. You know what I mean? And that's how they want to bless you. And you need to receive that. We need to receive that as a blessing of God. Thank God that they want to share. But Paul is saying, you know, we work toiled night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. I didn't want to be a burden. What what Paul wanted the people to focus on, Don't don't just see what we're doing. But we're doing it on behalf of Jesus Christ. We we want to look. We want you to see that Christ will take care of all your needs and will be with you and will help you. But then he goes on. He says, "We we work day and night. We didn't want to be a burden to you, not because we did not have authority." See that Paul says we could have said to you, "Hey, we're an apostle here. You know, I got my MA and my BA and my doctorate, and I got all this education. You know." And I could have commanded you to look after me. That's what Paul is saying. He says, you know, I live by example that you'll want you to follow me. And I said, I didn't. And he didn't command them with his own authority that God had gave him. See, Jesus could have done that too. 
Remember, Jesus could have commanded 10,000 angels. Jesus could have. He had the authority over all things. But what did Jesus, how did he use his authority? To come as a servant. To come as a servant. To come as a servant so he wouldn't be a burden to us, but he could be a blessing of eternal life and give the gift of eternal life to each one of us. And he says, it is not because we did not have the authority. We could ask, but we didn't. But there's our connecting work. But to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. So all the way through this, Paul is saying, okay, let's get out of this disorderly stuff and let's get into this following stuff. Let's get into following Jesus Christ because the word follow is used a couple times. How you should follow us us again up in verse 7 how you ought to follow us and so paul was really trying to show them that they are that they were an example even when paul wrote letters for timothy and titus and all that you know and said he they're okay whatever they teach you or whatever they say follow it that's that's powerful stuff that i don't know if we ever grasp that as pastors elders and deacons and sunday school teachers that we're not only commanding and and sharing and giving forth the word of god but there is a part where we're standing up in front of them as a leader and say as i follow christ you follow me you know and i don't want to be disorderly paul says but i want to set the example isn't these amazing thoughts that he is saying to the church he says for even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone not work, neither shall he eat. So now we're back to this whole idea where people were kind of sitting back and, you know, you know, they had made a little bit of wealth or they had sold a few little things and now they weren't doing anything and they were just sitting back and, and just kind of eating and drinking and be merry for whatever, you know what I mean? And Paul says, no. Hey, believers, you know, there's always something you can do. And I believe Paul wants people to work because he wants people to give. He wants them to have the blessing to give. Not always just to be people receive, 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 receive. But, you know, he wanted people to give, give, give. So go out and get a job. Go out, work in the field, do whatever it is. Go down on the corner and if you only get a day job, you know, Paul was kind of saying to him, you know, quit sitting around and just doing nothing. But get up and do something. Multiply that which God has given you. And then as you get blessed, blessed back, then you can give into the kingdom of God. And so I think it's interesting here. If anyone will not work. So there must have been problems in the church where people just didn't want to work. And I don't know if we want to say that in the spiritual realm, but this was an issue of both physically too. They weren't physically wanting to work. So Paul was saying, well, maybe you shouldn't be eating either. And if you get hungry enough, maybe then you will start working. <laughs> I'm not sure why Paul is saying that to the church, but there must have been something going on there that he had to put his finger on by the Holy Spirit and say, come on now, Thessalonians. You know, you need to start getting more involved. You need to start working so that you can receive, so that I believe that you can give. And so he talks to them, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. And then finally for today, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. Here's our word disorderly again. You know, they're not wanting to walk, they're not wanting to work, you know, but they're wanting to eat, you know. And maybe Paul was, was focusing back on, on, on communion. I don't know, because sometimes, you know, the communion got turned into parties where, where people, you know, uh, would go and, and eat themselves silly before they have communion. And maybe Paul is thinking back then and says, hey, you're going to take up, uh, you know, of communion and that. Go eat at home first. You know, go work, go provide for yourself, then come together in fellowship. I don't know if that's what he's all doing or trying to get at, but it's interesting because as he goes in here, he says, you know, 
Hey, church, there is brothers who are walking disorderly, you know, and we've tried to set the pattern that we're not to walk it disorderly. And here again, he says, and you've got people within the church that are being disordered. Now, remember, this idea of disorder means unruly, chaotic, rebellious. So he says from, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a, in a disorderly manner. That means your lifestyle doesn't line up to Jesus Christ. I know these are challenging words, but we need to think about them. The book, the Bible, is Holy Scripture. It's holy. It's there to bring us into a holiness, to bring us into a cleansing, into sanctification, into a understanding that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, and that Jesus is the life. Amen? And so that's why he's saying, hey, when you believe those three things, that he is the way, truth, and life, the way you order your life will not be a life of disorder, but it will be a life of order. It won't be a life of confusion, but it will be a life that, that is, has understanding and knowledge built into it so that you can walk out the will of God daily. So he, then he goes on and he says, it says, okay, those are the ones who are working, you shouldn't eat. And then there's this disorderly. And then he throws another little thing in here right at the end. I just, <laughs> I just love it. I just love it. I don't know, you know, when I think about how these these men of God were moved by the power of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit moves on them to say, sometimes just amazes me. And here's one of those ones that just seems to be right there, right in your face. You know, he's not only talking about work and that you shouldn't eat, and he's now he's talking about those who have got disorderly manner and how they're not working at all at all. They're not working at all. But he goes on and he gives that word, but again, a comparison, but our busy bodies. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, Paul, you know, uh, this is it. And he's talking to the church. Okay, get this. He's talking to disciples. They're not wanting to work. They're not wanting, you know, they're not wanting to get involved. They're living a disorderly life, some of them, not all of them. And not only that, Paul was saying, and they're busy bodies. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know what the word busybody means, but some synonyms are as a meddler. You like to meddle into things. You like to get into the gossip. And uh, one of the synonyms that it had, and I had to look at it twice, uh, one of the synonyms of a, a busybody is a blabbermouth. <laughs> so not only they're gaining information and sitting around doing and, and just hearing all they can hear and take it all in, then they're going to go out and blabber it all over the place. Hey, did you see that person? Did you see that person? Did you see what was going on there? Did you... And they now become people of authority, I guess, because they know everything about everybody else. They won't work. They just want to eat other people's food. They're disorderly. And not only that, they become a bunch of busybodies. Can you imagine that? He's saying that there are these kinds of people in the church. Woo! That's hot stuff, I think. <laughs> I don't, maybe none of you have ever run into that or no, you don't know. Maybe none of you don't know any people like that. Or you might be saying, oh, come on, pastor. <laughs> you know, uh, I know some disorderly people. I know some people that just don't want to do anything and they just want to eat. And I, I know a bunch of busybodies and stuff like that. While Paul was trying to say, okay, church, that's not the way we should be. And so Paul is saying, don't be disorderly. I, Because we're not disorderly, then you shouldn't. Don't be lazy. We're working night and day so we can bring the gospel to you. Don't be sitting around like a bunch of busybodies, you know, meddling and getting in the gossip and blabbermouthing. Let's begin to stand up and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today, as we look at this passage of scriptures where Paul is warning against disorderly idleness, we need to ask ourselves, is there anything in there this morning that the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on in our lives? And maybe what we need to do. And I found it was interesting that I thank God that, you know, the opportunities to be out of the mall also create can create opportunities of great blessings and great challenges. And many times... You got to be careful 
what you speak and how you speak it, how you live, how you act, because there's a whole lot of people watching. And you know what they want to see? They want to really see is Jesus Christ, our Lord, living in us, working out his will in our lives, empowering us, strengthening us, and giving us victory. That's what they want to see. They want to see a living God, not a talked about God, but a living God who is dwelling in us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, wow, we thank you for what Paul is trying to remind the church of and to remind all of us, not only the Thessalonians, but each one of us that are listening today, that we would then take this and, and as a measuring stick and hold it up against our lives and say, OK, Lord, where are we in all of this? What are you trying to show us? And so, Father, as we go forth today, oh God, I pray that we will go forth in a way that our lives will be a pattern where people will see Jesus in us and say, yeah, that's what I want to follow. That's what I want to live. We won't be people of disorder running to and fro and and just, you know, bringing about confusion. And Pete, Lord, we won't be people that just sit around and be busybodies. But, Father, that we will be people that will go out and proclaim your good news, Jesus to proclaim that you are the way, the truth, and the life, to proclaim the power of the gospel. And so, Lord, I just thank you for what you're speaking into our hearts today. Be with each one who hears this around the world, and may it affect us and change us from the inside out now. And we give you thanks in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And if you want to respond to that through Messenger or message us or privately or whatever, Go for it. And those who are locally in the area, if you want to come on out to the mall and say hello, we love to pray for you or give you a hug or whatever. Carefully, we give a hug. <laughs> and, you know, just rejoice together. Come and see what the Lord is doing. Amen. So we love you. Keep on keeping on. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. And if we don't see you between now and tomorrow, I encourage you to come to Gospel Chapel on the brokery. We'll have a good time there, worshiping and praising God. Amen. Love you now. Bye-bye.